the Gilda's maximum lawyers community of legal entrepreneurs who are taking their businesses and lives to the next level. As a Guild member, you'll build relationships, be held accountable, and learn strategies specifically designed to get you unstuck and accelerate your plan for growth. Members are also granted exclusive access to masterminds hosted around the country. Our next event is coming up, and we're heading to Scottsdale, Arizona. There's something truly magical about the power of these in-person connections where real-time breakthroughs happen. Picture this. You're surrounded by like-minded law firm owners tackling your business and mindset challenges together. The energy is electric, the insights are transformative, and the results are game-changing. Investing in yourself is the best decision you'll ever make. The knowledge, strategies, and breakthroughs you'll gain are priceless assets that will supercharge your practice and propel you forward. Join the Guild and secure your ticket to Scottsdale at the best possible price by visiting maxlawevents.com. Hey guys, Brett Tremblay, co-founder of Get Staffed Up, and you are listening to the Maximum Lawyer Podcast. Well, we just had a great episode with Brett Tremblay. I'm really excited to see him at MaxLawCon. You know, he's been a great supporter of ours. Uh, He was at Del Mar Hall, and I didn't realize how young his business was at that time. But I mean, I do know this. Of all the sponsors at the conference last year, I believe that Get Staffed Up probably had the most customers. And from what I've heard, the most satisfied customers, a lot of the people, and I don't, I'm not saying this is a plug. He's not paying us. This episode really has nothing to do with the fact that they're sponsoring us. I just always want to talk to interesting lawyers who, you know, have a self-managing law firm, which we all know a lot of us view as the holy grail of, of being a lawyer and also has a, a side business that's actually helping lawyers get to where they want to go. So I just thought we had to have Brett on the show. Yeah. Every once in a while, you'll have a a guest come on and they'll say something and it is like a light switch, right? And the whole thing about the owner's box. And I've heard him talk about the owner's box before when it comes to a law firm, but it's still like he mentioned it again. It's just like a light switch. You're like, oh yeah. The whole idea of being in the owner's box, if you want to have a law firm and you don't really want to have much to do with the law firm other than just being the owner, which is like, if you think about other industries, Jim, like think about owning a restaurant, right? Or a hair salon or you name, like my dad, a mechanic, right? My dad's a mechanic. So it's more like a lawyer, but a lot of these other businesses, you don't see the owner in there, you know, rolling the dough, right? The owner's somewhere else. They're in the owner's box. And it, it's, it's interesting to me how lawyers, we don't quite view it that way. We don't view it as businesses as much as some other businesses. So him bringing that up was really cool. I just, I think it's a, it's a great light switch moment. I've never had someone named Ruth or Chris serve me a steak at Ruth Chris Steakhouse. So your point is well taken. I think that as often we say on this show and in maximum law minimum time, we can learn a lot from other industries. And, you know, the other point that I thought Brett made that was really good is that lawyers are so slow to change so slow to change we got to move fast people we got to move fast people because he's right he's right these younger people are coming behind us and starting law firms and they're not carrying all this baggage you have of somewhere in these dusty law books a good idea was lost no 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 we're done with all that we're done with all that our our good friend from the beginning of maximum lawyer steve bartle he leveled the field when it came to family law in st louis county because he figured out seo than a lot of the old codgers. So it, the, these days are, are coming and he's probably right. It probably is closer to 2037, but there's no reason why we can't or our listeners can't be the ones leading the field. Yeah, those uh, attorneys that were mad about you whenever you entered the space, whatever your space is, guess what? There's another round coming right behind you. So every you year, watch out. Every, every year. Every single year, and they're coming for you. So all right, everybody, enjoy the episode. Run your law firm the right way. This is the Maximum Liar Podcast. Maximum Liar Podcast. Your hosts, Jim Hacking and Tyson Mutrix. Let's partner up and maximize your firm. Welcome to the show. Welcome back to the Maximum Lawyer Podcast. I'm Jim Hacking. And I'm Tyson Mutrix. What's up, Jimmy? Oh, well, Tyson, when I logged in, I saw you doing a little demo of your plane landing on a runway somewhere. So that's sort of exciting. Yeah, uh, Brett was actually asking about like, a, like, how do you come in for landing? It's kind of cool because like you got to dip the nose down, but then once you get down to actually land the plane, it's the opposite. You know, you got to pull back on it, and so it's it's yeah. So I was demonstrating. I had my own little Cessna back there and a little fake runway. That's fun. I I like talking about it. It's, it's fun to talk about. Complete with a runway. That's right. I was 
I was just out in Boulder, Colorado, and there must have been an airstrip nearby because there were all these beautiful jets. You would have loved them, Tyson, just flying all around and landing all the time. Yeah, it's uh, there were some cool ones out at the at the airport today. More jets at the airport today than normal. Yeah, they are really cool. There is someone introduced me to diamond airplanes yesterday and it, just Google diamond airplanes. They are amazing. They're gorgeous looking airplanes. You want to go ahead and introduce our guest? Yeah, absolutely. Cause I'm sure that no one wants to hear us talk about on a lawyer podcast about <laughs> flying. So absolutely. So our guest today is Brett Trembley. He is the co-founder of Get Stepped Up uh, and one of the sponsors of Max Lawcon 2022, and, and I also a sponsor of, of Max Lawcon 2021. So, and we'll get into the Brett's background in a moment. But uh, Brett, welcome to the show. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate you having me. Brett, would love to hear about your law firm that you have, how it started, and how it grew, and then how you segued into Get Staffed Up. Absolutely. So th- again, thank you guys for having me on. My favorite thing in law school was was the mock trial team. And so I just knew that that's, you know, I wanted to be a litigator if I wanted to practice law, because I think like a lot of people, I went to law school to just, I wanted the education and I wanted to continue being a student and, and kind of delay adulthood. So I didn't know if I was going to practice law, but I, I do come from a, a family of, of small business owners and always had the entrepreneurial bug. But right after law school, I went to work for a small law firm in South Miami, did that for about three years and just knew that that's not where I was going to end up, right? Like this, this wasn't what I was meant to do. And, but I really like litigation and I like helping people and going to court and and fighting the good fight. And so I started my own law firm in 2011. It's actually 11-1-11, not planned that way. It's not like a wedding, right? Where I picked that date out for, for three years in advance. And, um, you know, started as a litigation firm. That's what I knew. And then over time, I realized I could help business owners stay out of court and not just wait and hope they get in trouble. And then I get to come in and try to save the day. So we sort of expanded to business law, doing, you know, general counsel work and keeping people, business owners out of court if possible. And if not, then we, we litigate in court. And it's been just over 10 years now. So it's been a lot of fun. Yeah. And I mean, you've grown it to 11 attorneys. I mean, you're, it's, it's a 30 person law firm. It's, I mean, it's, it's really interesting. You've had the growth with your law firm and you've had uh, growth with Get Staffed Up. So I, I, what are some of the uh, principle, the principles that you applied to your law firm that you also applied to Get Staffed Up that's allow you to grow? Well, listen, my first two and a half years in business were really rough and I wasn't growing and I was, you know, it was like, when, where's my next client going to come from? And am I going to be able to pay the mortgage? You know, it was very difficult. So when I made my first hire, somebody finally convinced me to hire somebody. I was just terrified of, of making that first hire because I had this idea in my head that I needed X amount of dollars in my business bank account before I could actually hire someone. Like I needed to cover their whole year salary. And that's just frankly not true. I think a lot of people sort of like, well, I can't afford to pay someone. My argument is you can't afford to do things yourself because you're just you're you're gonna get paid for what you do. And 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 people use this analogy all the time, but I don't think it quite sinks into people that when you are doing anything other than legal work as an attorney, as as a law firm owner, you are gonna net like $10, $15 an hour. And and when you look at the statistics of the average solo attorney bills about one hour per day. You just do the math and, and it's very accurate. And that was my experience because you don't realize you, you, you're working so hard and so much just on all of the things that a business requires you to do that you don't realize you're only doing, you know, that one hour per day. And, and sometimes you're working until two in the morning or you're, you're doing weekends. So it feels like you're doing more. But as you guys know, we get caught up in the email and, and, and everything else and the actual work that pays the bills you know, it just, it suffers. And so I hired my first person for 30 hours a week. She was a law student. So I hired a law clerk, but I gave her all of the, of the, the phone answering, the messages, even some writing, you know, I, I was, I was helping her out as well to learn. And I doubled my firm in, in, in July of, of 2014, like the revenue just doubled. And it seems like, wow, how'd you do that? Well, if you're doing one hour of work every day, billable, and you do two, 
that's double. I mean, it's it's just simple math, and it, and it makes so much sense looking back, and it's it's some, somewhat embarrassing looking back. But at the same time, I think a lot of people have that fear of failure, like I did. Like if I was going to hire someone, and then be just so embarrassed not to be able to pay them because that's what I thought would happen. But turns out the right hire, they make you money. They don't cost you money. And so at that point, at least I learned the lesson and I just went for it. I started hiring more and more people and, and working just as hard. And a year later, I hired my first attorney, terrified to death whether I was going to be able to pay that attorney. And then two months later, I had to hire another one. And so just rinse and repeat. And, and we've been growing you know, ever since. I literally think that that topic of the first hire is the thing that we talk about the most in Maximum Lawyer. I think that's the biggest hurdle for people to get over. Now, I did have an interesting conversation, Brett. I'd love to get your feedback on this yesterday with one of the Guild members about she believes us. She believes all three of us that you need to hire staff. And so she's hired staff. She's hired a paralegal, a legal assistant, and a lawyer. And the interesting thing is she's used the time of having them on the team to fix her systems, which I totally get, but she hasn't upped her marketing. She hasn't upped her desired caseload. And so then she was feeling, maybe I need to contract. Do I need, maybe I made these hires too early. Can you talk about sort of what your advice would be to her and other people who've, who've made that investment in the hire, but then what do you have to do? I think I know what you need to do, but I'd love to hear what you think. What do you need to do at that point to keep the flywheel going? Yeah, well, you mentioned a few things to touch upon there. One is systems don't matter if you don't have the incoming business, right? If you're not doing marketing and networking, then don't spend your time on systems because you're building a roller coaster without anyone waiting in line to get on the roller coaster. And it's like, you're going to spend a lot of money doing that because time is money. And, and it, it's that's not the first thing you, you should do it, in, in, at least in my humble opinion. And, and the, I, I don't know this you know, person that you're referring to, obviously. So making three hires, I don't know what kind of, what kind of revenue she already had or, or what kind of, of business. You know? And again, depending on if it's a personal injury firm and how many cases you have in the queue and, and if, you know, can you predict you're going to settle this amount of cases over the next you know, 12, 18 months or if it's a billable hour firm. So every firm is different. But like the, 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 the exercise that I tell people to do. And again, I'm, I'm not a coach, right? And I think that just through my experience of doing this for 10 years and being around so many other law firms and, and different groups, I, I do bring knowledge and, and, and some credibility. But again, I don't like go out there and coach people. But when we do get into exercises with clients, or maybe I'm at a speaking gig, and I suggest make a list of everything that you're doing in a day and, and, you know, maybe over three days, just everything. Yeah. You know, like I wake up in the morning, I put on my clothes, I brush my teeth and, and I'm not exaggerating. Just like try to track your time because how we spend it, like we all have the same amount of time in a day. And until you change how you spend your time, you, you like you, you can't get out of the, what, like you reap what you sow because of where you put your time. And so if, like what I tell people to do is delegate or hire someone for the, the lowest sort of common denominator, the things that, that are going to be the quickest and easiest to get off your plate and that are going to cost you the least amount of money. You don't want to start building huge systems because that takes a lot of thought and a lot of time. You want to just delegate the, the easier stuff, which may require holding on to the legal work yourself for a while. You know, I waited until my law firm was knocking on the door of like 25 to 30 grand every month in revenue. And I had people answering the phones. I had a, a quasi paralegal and I had a few other staff members. But before I, I made that leap to hire the first attorney, you know, I really, and maybe I waited too long, you know, maybe you could grow faster, but that was, you know, my experience of, of doing the math and crunching numbers of where I thought it was a good idea to invest in somebody who is going to be a, a much higher salaried employee than somebody that you just want to get in the door to free up your time. And if you just free up your time to, again, do two hours of legal work per day, or, you know, to do one extra networking lunch or, or five extra calls, because what you said, Jim, like you have to get in the business. That's where your focus should be as the business owner of, I need to get people into my restaurant before I worry about creating a slightly better dish for them to eat. 
Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, like with PI, it's really important that you get the business, but then you also have to do the work. So I think that's funny how Jim and I, we look at things the same when it comes to the marketing, but we look at things a little bit differently when it comes to the systems because they are really, really important. And if we don't have the people in place, once we get those cases in, they don't move and we don't get paid. Then we have another problem because we can't pay the employees that we need because we're not moving the cases. So it is this problem that it's, it's a it's a constant thing we've got we've to deal with. Which brings me to Get Staffed Up. So with Get Staffed Up, tell us about how that came about. Because, I mean, it's kind of a crazy thing. You've got a successful law firm and then you're like, oh, I'm going to start a business. So, so how did that come about? Well, yeah, I mean, that, that, that was, I guess that was sort of my intent. So my personality profile is I'm a, like I, I come in and I like to, to work real hard and fix things. And then when I get to a certain point, I, I, I kind of I'm looking for my next opportunity. And so I spent an, a three intentional years of molding and creating and growing the leadership team at my law firm, who, which is now basically run by a managing partner and some other partners to be able to step out and have the opportunity to work on another project. And so I have a business partner that gets that up and we had spent several years in the same mastermind group and the same bar association and, and really just becoming, I mean, again, maybe like you two, Tyson and Jim, I, I was going to ask you kind of like how you guys met and, and, and where Maximum Lawyer came from, but we had synergy and we knew we wanted to do something together. And then he found out about offshore staffing because offshore staffing was like, you know, people who answer the phones who like, no offense, but for big companies that you can't understand. Or, or big companies are doing this, this nasty thing called outsourcing, and it's so terrible. That was like in my, and I think a lot of people's understanding, what quote unquote, which we don't do outsourcing, but that's kind of what people thought of it as. So bringing that to the small business sector and, and you know specifically law firms, he met somebody um, and then he went out and found out how to start recruiting in different countries. And I was telling him, look, man, I was at the same time working on something called the hiring pros because I had gone through the Goldman Sachs 10,000 small business program. And through that program, the biggest pain point of there's 30, 30 business owners in Miami from all different sectors. And their biggest pain point was hiring. And I'm thinking to myself, like, I've grown an amazing team. I can help people learn how to hire better and learn the right way to do it. So I'm sketching out this small business plan and, and maybe I'm going to tinker with was selling some things and, and, and doing some, in that case, it, it would have been a little more coaching on hiring. But then when this came along, like it touched upon my early pain point, which I talked to you guys about is I couldn't make that first hire. And so helping people with the cost side of that first hire to me was like, I could help other people who are stuck like I was and who are just terrified of making that investment. And so, you know, I went ahead and made his first two sales for get staffed up. I mean, it wasn't named at that point, but I was just talking it up. And he said, why don't we do this business together? And I said, I'm in, you know, where do I sign? So we basically cemented the idea in early 2018. And then we did spend some time, you know, Tyson, to your point, building the back end, the systems, right? Because we had some capital that we could invest and build some systems before, you know, we launched. And we made, we asked a few friends to sign up and they did. And then we officially launched in early July of 2018. And, um, you know, look, fast forward four years, it's great timing, right? We spent two years convincing the legal world, hey, it's okay to hire people virtually. Trust us, you can do this. Let, let us teach you how. And then the pandemic hits and then it's like, okay, our number one objection is no longer even an objection anymore. So things just really took off from there. Have you ever felt overwhelmed with everything there is to do within your legal practice? How do you keep up with your legal work while making time for growing your practice and attracting clients? Do important things like deadlines and even your family fall through the cracks? This is why you should join us at the number one conference for legal entrepreneurs, Max LawCon. We're going to be focused on helping practices scale and bringing calm to the order. This conference is curated in order to accelerate your implementation. Based on where you are in your legal practice, we're going to help you identify exactly what is most important right now. When you leave Max LawCon, you go home with complete clarity, focus, and a plan to make 2022 your best year ever. And not only your best year in terms of revenue, but your best year in terms of time. Time back with your family. 
more time to do the work that is in your zone of genius, only taking the clients that you like, and more money in your pocket. It's all at the Maximum Lawyer Conference. Max LawCon is a two-day event on Thursday, June 2nd and Friday, June 3rd in St. Charles, Missouri. Seats are filling fast. Grab yours today at www.maxlawcon2022.com. You're listening to the Maximum Lawyer Podcast. Our guest today is Mr. Brett Trembley. He's the owner of a self-managing law firm, and he's also the co-founder of Get Staffed Up. Brett, I love to hear from people about the moment that they knew that something was working, the moment they knew that they were on the right track. For me, I remember the first time I I got a telephone call from my YouTube channel. I was like, holy cow, somebody could call me after watching one of my videos. What was the moment or moments when you realized that Get Staffed Up was going to work? Okay, I don't want this to sound too sort of presumptuous. So my law firm, I, there was, you know, a year and a half, maybe two years, I didn't know if it was going to work. And then, you know, once I hired someone and and again, like in one month, we double revenue, I was like, okay, I think this is going to work. Get Staffed Up was one of those aha moments. It really was. It was like, wait a minute, you know, like with the, with the right model and the right focus on finding not just warm bodies, not just resumes, but, but recruiting really talented people. Like everyone's number one pain point is, is people. It's, it's, it's employees for better or for worse because we can't make money without them. We can't provide really good, you know, lives for them without having a really good business. And early on, we were, we were sitting on my porch and he had hired a few people from the Philippines and he had found a marketing assistant for me for the Philippines. And we were sketching out the business model and saying like, this is going to be big. So, uh, you know, I, it just like, we, we just, we're both lawyers, right? We just had the feeling that we're onto something and it turned out we were right. I wonder at a certain point, because we talked to a, a lawyer owner last week and their ultimate goal is to exit the practice of law at some point. So I wonder for you, like, are you, are you going to maybe wind down the law firm? Are you going to keep the law firm open and, and, and then devote most of your time to get stepped up? How are you going to deal with these two entities? Do you have other business ideas in the future? I'm really curious as to what your plans are. Well, it's funny because it was actually last year at Max Law Con, one of the breaks, somebody asked me like, am I running my law firm? And I said, no, I'm in the owner's box. And, and all of a sudden there's like five people around me like, what's the owner's box? You know, everybody wanted to know how do I own a law firm without practicing law? So, you know, I, there's no need to wind down a law firm, which is, which is still growing. It, it's still a very successful law firm. It's just that the credit doesn't go to me, you know, it goes to the team. And, um, you know, part of, the challenge of, of stepping out is making sure you have the right team in place. Cause we all know the bigger examples, the horror stories of a business hiring the wrong CEO. And then, you know, the stock tanks and, and some people attach their, their ego to like, well, this thing failed without me. So clearly I'm the great person, right? Well, really the, the right person, you know, who's quote unquote, you know, gonna, gonna, run things the right way, we'll find the right successor and help build that team and turn it over to someone who's hopefully going to do better than them. And, you know, if, if I had experience share or, or people wanted to learn about that process, that is something that, you know, I would be happy to share more on and, and how, how I am able to step out of, of the law firm. Now, I still do quarterly retreats. I'm still on, on one meeting per week on Fridays and I'm, I still have, have my hand in it and, and things, you know, there's, there's good, Good points and bad points in any business. So anyway, I just wanted to sort of make, make that point, Tyson. For me, Get Staffed Up is with our ability to recruit on scale because we all, we all know now there's ways to find you know, virtual assistants yourself. And, and a, lot of, a lot of people, especially in smaller firms, are doing that. It's kind of like, you know, and, and, I, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm an advocate of that. I'm just an advocate of lawyers not doing everything themselves. It's kind of like I'm projecting. I'm telling myself back when I was 30 years old, like, man, it's like I yell at myself all the time. Just like get your head out and, and stop doing everything yourself. And so there's different ways to get help. There's domestic, there's overseas, there's full time, there's part time. I really push back on part time because I think you're selling yourself short. Not everybody wants to drive you know, uh, a Mercedes, some people are happy in their vehicle. And that's kind of how I look at where you find someone and who you work with. And some people say, look, time is money. And I, and I like your replacement guarantee. You know, I want you guys to find me somebody great and, and I'm going with you. 
And we, with our ability to recruit at scale, then the recruiting side is really sort of limitless in what it can do, Tyson, in the future and in, in, in helping really amazing people from, from Latin America and South Africa find incredible jobs. So whether that continues to be only in, in the, the legal side of things with Get Staffed Up or if we're partnering with new businesses, you know, we, we see ourselves as an international recruiting and staffing company and there's no plan right now to slow down. I love your concept of the owner's box. I love your mission to free lawyers from feeling like they have to do everything. I'd love to hear, Brett, what do you think law firms look like in 2027? The legal field, in my opinion, is very slow to change. So I don't think that's far enough out. I think that younger attorneys starting firms are starting to look a little bit more like we're starting to catch up a little bit, right? But if someone is, you know, a a 60 year old lawyer right now, because you can go back to your BNI groups or, or whatever networking groups. And unfortunately, there's still the older attorneys with the one employee who is a receptionist, a paralegal, and they just kind of do everything right. And if that person left, then the, the firm would be devastated. So they're compensated, you know, for, for, you know, I guess what they'll accept. And that lawyer goes out and his law firm looked the same 10 years ago as it does now. And my business partner, and I talk about this, a lot of the law firms that we were networking with 10 years ago in, in our bar association, they look identical. So 2027, I, I don't see a big change. 2037, I, you know, that's enough time with, you know, states are now changing non-lawyer ownership like Arizona has done. We've got AI, which is slow to develop, but will catch on. I think you're going to start to see other states and then private equity money come into law firms. The unfortunate part of that is I think this small law firm will have a harder time competing with the bigger firms. Because right now, there seems to be a shift away from the bigger firms and, and, and clients can understand, I can get the same service out of a, a 10 attorney litigation firm that I can out of a Greenberg Trorig, you know, and, and they're going to charge me five times as much. And that's not an exaggeration. That's something we see all the time. Um, so I wish I was really good at, at predicting exactly what they were going to look like. And I don't think I am, Jim. But I just know that the legal field especially is, is slow to react. You've got you've got rules, bar, you know, we have a bar, you know, not lawyers can't practice. Like lawyers are very good at creating their own monopoly. And and it's just a little bit ironic. Yeah, I actually don't think that they are as good as, as what uh, doctors are, but uh, we are pretty good at, at doing it, that's for sure. But uh, we are uh, getting close to time, so I'm going to start to wrap things up. I, I think, yes, Jim. Before we wrap, I, I have to ask one more question of Mr. Brett, if that's okay. Go right ahead. Season six of our favorite lawyer program, Better Call Saul, just dropped last week. Now, just for those who don't know, I started watching... Better Call Saul before I watched Breaking Bad. So that's sort of crazy. Now, I've since gone back and watched all of Breaking Bad. And I've now I'm now working my way through Better Call Saul again to get ready. I I haven't watched okay new season yet, but I have an understanding that you have a special connection to the Better Call Saul universe. And I was wondering if you could tell the audience about that. Oh man, now, now, now you got me excited. So I wish I could say special connection. That is definitely an overstatement. (laughs) Um, but look, I, so I grew up in Albuquerque or just outside of Albuquerque, little suburb. So breaking bad for us is like our Eiffel tower. Like that, like we, like, that's what we want to be known for. We embrace that universe just completely. It it, it is one of the the best shows to ever be on television, but it's also like, you know, you know, like kind of like Bugs Bunny, right? Like, like took a left in Albuquerque. Like we we just get skipped over, you know, in, in, in the state, like we're always overshadowed. And so that's kind of like our, like, look, look at us, you know, we're, we're on the map. So I flew back in September to be an extra on Better Call Saul. It was the last season and I knew I would regret it because this has been on, on my, my wish list for 10 years. And so um, you, you weren't supposed to be out of state. So I kind of lied about where I lived because you're when you apply to be an extra, you're supposed to be available in 24 hours notice, right? And flying, like your, your scene can get cut. You know, a lot of extras that people don't realize you show up and there's this big group of people and they move you in and then they start, they kind of have a, an idea of, of where they want, what they want to do with you and, and you're nervous. And then if they need one lawyer sitting at a table for a scene, they're going to have three potential extra lawyers. So you may not even get 
to even sit there and potentially be in a scene. You may just sit there all day and, and not be in front of camera. So I went back twice and I kind of learned what to do and, and, and volunteer quickly and get myself in there. And so there's a restaurant scene that I'm, I'm right by Gus and I'm looking into the camera. So it depends on, on, on what angle they use. Cause I'm either going to be front and center or, you know, the back of my head. <laughs> and uh, there's another scene where I got to sit next to Kim Wexler when she's doing a final argument. And I was so excited for that one. I, I, I imagined, of course, like me doing a screenshot and there's Kim and I'm like in the screen with her. I'm going to print this thing and someday have it signed. Hilarious. With the way the camera angle is, maybe my left hand gets in the scene. Like <laughs> maybe <laughs> if I'm lucky. So uh, anyway, there, it was a lot of fun. Now three episodes of season six have come out. I'm My, my restaurant scene is, or, or courtroom scene, they're not in yet. So I'm, I'm, I'm on pins and needles, hoping obviously that I make it. This is awesome. I did not know this. So this is, this is really exciting stuff. I can't, I haven't started the new season either. So I'm, I want to rewatch all the other episodes. So this is, yeah. this is awesome. Nice. Very I cool. That too. I binged season five, Demi, which is an amazing season, just so I could get ready for season six. So. Oh, that's awesome. So very cool. Oh, we do need to wrap things up. We're definitely over time now. So uh, we're <laughs> going to wrap things up. I want to remind everyone to join us in the big Facebook group. A lot of great uh, information being shared on a daily basis. If you want a more high level conversation, join us in the guild, maxlawguild.com. Remember to get your tickets. It's only a couple months away to the conference, maxlawcon. 2022.com and while you're listening to the rest of this episode if you don't mind leaving us a review if you've been listening to this podcast for years now please leave us a review i help spread the love all right jimmy what's your hack of the week i'm making my way through a book called the promise that changes everything and it's by a woman named nancy klein and i'll give you the real quick version of what the promise is the promise that changes everything according to nancy klein is that when you're talking to someone in your mind, you promise yourself that you're not going to interrupt them. And that when you don't interrupt, there's an alchemy almost that comes from them processing through their own questions. And if you just listen and listen and don't feel the need to jump in and solve whatever they're asking about or talking about just to listen, it really changes the whole dynamic. So the book is really good. I started practicing it with my kids and nor said something's different with daddy like what's wrong so it's 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 going to be a work in progress but i really think it's it's powerful so far at least that's really cool um i i so badly wanted to interrupt you uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's just a mess with you but i held off i really wanted to so badly but I, I i'm proud of myself cut myself on the back for not doing it but very cool i like that that's great all right brett you know the routine uh we always ask our guests to give a tip or hack of the week do you have a tip or hack for us oh man delegate your way to freedom it's well what we live by it's like whatever find something this week that you know you shouldn't be doing and just ha- have someone else do it just just practice because because it, delegation sometimes it, it has a dirty connotation. It doesn't need to. It's give someone else the opportunity to take on a task for you and watch them be happier and watch you be happier. Yeah, I totally agree. I don't, and I don't know why it's got that negative connotation, but it does. So, but I, I, I completely agree with you. All right. So my um, on my wall right here, I have people can't see it, but uh, on my wall, I've got uh, all of our KPIs, the things that we track on a regular basis. And it's really helpful for me if like, it's just a good reminder. And I come in, I look at, I mean, I see it on my wall. It's right there. It's a good reminder. My advice to people is to just pick one KPI because I know that a lot of people don't have any KPIs to pick out, but pick out like whatever, whatever that most important number is for you, for your firm. For us, it's, it's our average fee. That is our, our one golden number, right? That is the golden number, but we track a bunch of other things too. So pick one number in your firm that's the most important. Put it on your wall as a reminder to you to constantly track it because it, it will help remind you on a daily basis that what, what's important. So I highly recommend doing that. Brett, thank you so much for coming on. I This is one of those episodes that I wish we could talk for a couple hours because I have so many other questions, but uh, we just limit on time. So so thank you so much for coming on. A lot of, a lot of great information you shared. Absolutely. I really appreciate you guys having me and looking forward to seeing you in June. Thanks, yeah, Brett. See you in a couple months. Thanks, Brett. Awesome. Thanks, guys. See you, bud. Thanks for listening to the Maximum Lawyer Podcast. The Maximum Lawyer Podcast. To stay in contact with your host and to access more content, more content. go to MaximumLawyer.com. Maximum Have a great week and catch you next time.